Right, so I think autumn is a, is a fantastic time to be thinking about colour. And over the last few weeks, we've seen the leaves on the trees change from these vibrant greens of summertime through this range of yellows and oranges and, and reds even, and lots of different, different browns. And it's a really beautiful time of year. But the thing that I think is, is most amazing about those colours is that they're generated just as much inside our nervous systems as they are up there in the branches of those trees. And I want to show you in this presentation why I, I say that and why I think it's important. Now, as we look up at those beautiful leaves in the tree, the light from, from reflected off of those leaves is focused onto the retina in the back of our eyes. And sitting in that retina are photoreceptors. Photoreceptors are cells that, that detect light and provide uh, signals that the nervous system can work with and kind of encode into colour information. The kind of photoreceptor that feeds into colour perception is called a cone. And in our retinas, there are three different varieties of cone. My graph over here on the left shows you the sensitivities of those cones. And on the, on the uh, horizontal axis there, I've got the different wavelengths of light going all the way from, from UV over on the left through violet and blue and green and yellow and over to red on the right. And the vertical axis there shows you the relative sensitivity of those different photoreceptors to those different wavelengths of light. What you can see there, I hope, is that our three different kinds of cone photoreceptor are sensitive to, to different kind of windows into this spectrum. So we've got one kind of photoreceptor, which is cone photoreceptor, which is sensitive to relatively short wavelengths. I'll call that the blue cone. Another one which is sensitive to sort of medium wavelengths, and I'll call that the green cone. And a final one which is sensitive to long wavelengths, which I'll call the red cone. Now what we have to, to kind of bear in mind here is that these three cells and their three responses are the only inputs that our brains have to build all of those wonderful colours that we see up in the, up in the trees, for example, in, in autumn time. And we can do a little experiment to kind of see how the nervous system uh, is actually able to do that. If you take a look at my, my pie chart over here, what I'd like you to do is, is focus your, your eyes on, on the centre, on the intersection of lines in the middle there, and just stare at it while I'm talking to you. As you're doing that, I want to tell you that each of those pie slices is strongly exciting one of your cone photoreceptor types, whilst it's letting the other two have a rest. So in the blue slice, the blue cone photoreceptor is working very hard and the others are, are, have sort of got their feet up a bit. In the green slice, it's the green one that's working hard. And in the red slice, it's the red one that's working hard. Okay. Now, just like us, after we've kind of worked hard, we need a bit of a sit down. We're not quite as ready to kind of jump up and do lots of, lots of work um, uh, when we've been working hard. So in just a second, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this to a white screen and I want you to carry on staring at that same spot. And I hope that when I do it, you're going to see a brief colour sensation. It might take a while to develop. You see that? What we've done there, what we've done there is we've tired out one of those kinds of photoreceptors. So because that photoreceptor is tired out and can't send a signal for the nervous system to use, only the other two photoreceptors can. So our brain creates a colour perception built on only those two photoreceptor responses. So you probably saw uh, yellow under the blue slice because our brain makes a comparison of the blue photoreceptor response against the other two. And underneath the green and the red slices, you probably saw a relatively more reddy and a relatively more greeny colour because our brain also makes a comparison of those green and red photoreceptor responses. So brains are able to make colour perceptions based on these three signals. And that's why we can do things like mess around with, with images and change the RGB, the red, green and blue values of, of pixels to make any colours that we'd like to make. If we understand that, then it's quite an interesting question to ask whether colour perceptions are similar across other species of animals. Let's go back to think about our cone photoreceptor sensitivities. This, this arrangement of three cones feeding into colour is called trichromacy. 
um, and we're trichromatic, um, so are lots of other primates. But actually, if we look at mammals more widely, we find that in their retinas, they mostly have two varieties of cone cell only, a little bit like if we took away one of those, those cone photoreceptors from, from our sensitivities here. So this means that for most mammals, they can make that comparison of sort of blue to yellowy greenness, but they can't make that same comparison of red to greenness that we can, that we can do as primates. This image shows you uh, a rambutan tree. Rambutans are, are tropical fruits um, which normally have quite a vibrant and striking colour. And what I've done to this image is I've modified it. I've modified it so the green and the red channels, which would normally be the, in, that in that image, provide exactly the same information. And so it looks a little bit like the, the view that a, that a dichromatic mammal would have of that, of that tree. And you can imagine, if you were trying to pick out from this view which were the ripe fruits and which were the unripe fruits, or, or where were the fruits compared to the leaves, or which were the kind of young and juicy leaves compared to the old and tough leaves, you'd have a, a kind of a tough job to be able to do it. But if I restore that image to, to have its uh, red and green information, the way that a trichromat can see it, you see, all of a sudden, it's quite easy to see those fruits and to make judgments about whether they're ripe or not, to spot them against leaves, to pick out leaves, and so on. So for, uh, for primates, trichromacy, this, the evolution of this extra cone type, provides a real advantage in, in, these, in, in kind of foraging. And we have a primate's visual system. It's quite annoying when, when, when people imagine then that mammals see colours in the same way that we do. And you might imagine, you might say, it's, it's like a red rag to a bull. By that, of course, I mean it's not very annoying at all because bulls are, are dichromatic. So to them, the red rag doesn't really look different from the yellow one or the green one because they just don't have the photoreceptor machinery to be able to perceive that aspect of colour. So that's what we see in mammals. Here are our cone photoreceptor sensitivities here. So might they be representative of the, of the colour vision that we see in other groups of animals? Well, they're certainly not representative of what we see in birds and in reptiles, because birds and reptiles form their colour perceptions using the responses of four different kinds of cone photoreceptors. And they have photoreceptors that are sensitive way down in, in the UV all the way through to, to the red over there on the right. So their colour perceptions are different to ours too. These are, the these are the photoreceptor sensitivities of a honeybee. And you can see that it can form colour sensations using three photoreceptors in the same way that we do. But its sensitivities include sensitivity to the UV um, over here on the left but no dedicated photoreceptor for the red over there on the right. So they, have, they can't really separate red from green, but they have this whole extra dimension of colour in the UV, which is not accessible to us. Thinking of these kinds of photoreceptor sensitivities brings me back full circle to think about autumn leaves again. Because you see, one of the ideas um, that biologists have proposed to explain why these autumn leaves have this bright, red, vibrant colours in, in, in autumn is they've proposed, well, maybe these things are signals to insects. Because in, in the sort of autumn time, insects like aphids are flying around and they're looking for somewhere to lay eggs that can overwinter and hatch out in spring to feed off this tree. So perhaps the tree is sending a signal through this redness to say to the aphid, I'm a really well chemically defended tree, you better steer clear of me and go and lay your eggs somewhere else. But actually aphids have got the same kind of photoreceptor sensitivities that we saw for the bee. So they're not able to separate red from green either. Um, and so to them, all of these, these leaves are sort of variations on this kind of greeny colour that, that vary mainly in, in, in brightness. So the idea doesn't work when we consider the way that their visual systems work. I think this stuff is all really interesting. You know, I, I think these ideas are, are, are fascinating. But what I wanted to get to was to tell you a little bit about why I think they can be really important. This creature is a, a tsetse fly. And tsetse flies live in sub-Saharan Africa. They're exclusive blood feeders, so the only nutrition they get is by, is by biting uh, wild and domesticated animals, humans included, and, and feeding from, from their blood. 
Unfortunately, when they do that, they transfer blood parasites called trypanosomes. And trypanosomes cause a variety of serious diseases. They cause sleeping sickness in humans, which is, is ultimately fatal if not treated. And they cause a disease called Nagana in cattle that kills about a million cattle annually. So they're a really serious problem for, for um, uh, rural communities in sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the device is to control these things because it's important to do that. You control those flies and then you can control the diseases that they spread. Um, include things like this. This is a tiny target and, it, and what it consists of basically is a coloured panel of fabric with a net adjacent to it. And the whole thing is coated in insecticide. So what you can do is place this out in the environment. Um, and then because the flies find this blue colour to be quite an attractive one, they spot it, they think it's interesting, they fly down and they make contact with the target, pick up uh, a dose of insecticide and as a result of that they fly away and, th and they die and then they're, they're controlled in that way. As you can imagine, lots of work has gone into perfecting those tiny targets. It's really important that they're, they're kind of optimally designed to be absolutely kind of efficient and cost effective and all of those good things. And the way they're tested is in experiments like this. This is the same sort of tiny target that I showed you, but it's set up with a grid of electrocuting wires over the top so that any, any tsetse that visit it are actually stunned in place so the researchers can count and see how efficient the, the target is at attracting those flies. And those vector biologists have done a lot of really intricate work perfecting every aspect of these things to make them absolutely as effective as they can be. And that has involved testing a whole variety of different fabrics to find the one that is the best, uh, best attractant for those flies. Now, bearing in mind some of the things I've talked about in this presentation, I think there might be another way that we can kind of add to this body of work to potentially improve these things even more. Because flies ha uh, have got five kinds of photoreceptors inside their compound eyes. And they, again, they don't have a red sensitive photoreceptor, but they have a couple of varieties that are sensitive down in the UV over here. And we know that it's those photoreceptor signals that actually feed into the behaviour and form the colour perceptions of those flies. So what I've been able to do is go back to that fabulous body of work that's been, been produced by, by these biologists and work out what are the photoreceptor signals to a fly that each of these, these fabrics would produce. And then how do those photoreceptor signals explain the attraction of the flies to those targets? In that way, we build up a model that says what do the colours look like from a fly's eye view and what aspect of colour from a fly's eye view is important in determining attraction. There's a really cool thing you can do after that. You, you may have, um, you know, at some point at home, you may have bought new curtains for the living room and wanted to, to have a paint that was exactly matched to those curtains. So you might have popped down to your local DIY store with a sample of the curtain material and they can mix up the paint that matches the curtain. What they do there is they use algorithms that match the photoreceptor signals that the two things cause, causing it to have the same colour from, from your point of view. Now we can use the same kind of principles, but we can modify them to use fly photoreceptor sensitivities. And instead of trying to match colours, we can use those same algorithms to kind of maximise the signals that, that determine the attraction of the flies. And we've been very lucky with, with the help of, of textile companies then to be able to produce fabrics that are, that, that in theory at least, should be uh, uh, highly attractive to these, these tsetse flies based upon their colour perceptions. And those targets are, at the moment, uh, being tested out in the field and, and I think it's a really exciting idea that, that I hope is, is, is going to be able to improve the control of, of those flies. For today, though, I, I, I want to I finish up um, by, by telling you again about these, these autumn leaves. And I know by this point of the year, most of them have blown off the trees. Um, but I hope that if you're kind of walking home today and having a look at those trees and, and perhaps spending a moment to look at those colours, that you might reflect that truly with those colours, beauty really is in the eyes of, of, of the beholder with those. And then a final thing I must add is, is obviously none of this, this is possible without the help of lots of people. And I want to send sin sincere thanks to, to those people for all of their help. Thank you very much.